So I'm going to talk today about .NET and Fun Platform. But before we get started, I just, I, 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 you know, you, I am very excited because today is the iOS 13 release. So, uh, you know, I know that this is being broadcast, so this is the time. So everybody, you know, set some time aside, get a, a private room, some candles, and uh, install your iOS. Uh, it's for those of us here in Montreal, it's going to be at 1 p.m., so I'm going to be unavailable at that time. So um, let's talk about .NET today. So today, uh, the, run the .NET runtime is a cross-platform, um, you know, it's a it's an execution engine that will take you to almost every uh, platform available on Earth or anyone that you might want to, to use. It runs from tiny Raspberry Pis to super microcontrollers. There was just one that came out last week called the, um, uh, from Wilderness Labs, tiny little controller running .NET that you can build. It runs on mobile devices. It runs on uh, big servers and so on. And, um, you know, it, it is now an open source platform. Um, it started as a proprietary um, development platform, now it's open source. And one thing that I've always uh, felt was incredible about .NET is that it was a runtime that was not frozen in, in time, and unlike many other languages of the era, 2000, 2001, it was one of those few things that uh, kept evolving and kept evolving the language and kept evolving very aggressively. So nowadays a lot of languages work this way, but this is something that has been uh, a tradition in the .NET world. Now um, this is a product that I've been working on for many years. It's uh, uh, what you see here is Visual Studio for Mac, and, uh, and it, it, it is being used to develop a mobile application, so you're developing .NET applications. In this case, I think it's iOS. It uh, doesn't really matter, but uh, this is a product that I've been working on. And, um, but my career started many, many years ago before, um, and, uh, and I think that I identify with the, the Uno community, both the users and the developers behind Uno, because uh, there was something that I wanted <laughs> somewhere else uh, that I couldn't get my hands on on my favorite platform. So, and this is what Uno has been doing, right? They, there is a platform, there's a developer API that they would like to bring, but it's not running on all the places uh, that you would like them to have, and this is what is fantastic about Uno. So my, uh, you know, my, first, my first brush with not having what I wanted was, I really believe in open source. I really like the vision of free software, but uh, you know I was so used to DOS, and this was my file manager. I used this thing called the Norton Commander many, many years ago, around you know in the late 1980s. And uh, when I went to Unix, you had to learn all these Unix commands, and it, it, it you know I could do it, but it was not my 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 choice. So I built this thing called the Midnight Commander, and there's a long story about the the naming, but I built this thing, and to this day, right? I I built this thing in 1992. And uh, to this day, I keep using this tool on a daily basis. So it's probably the software that, uh, probably the software that has had the most bang for the buck for me uh, personally. And uh, you know, back in those days, um, I was very interested in this free operating system, and I figured, how can we help this free operating system get more applications? So I contributed to another effort called the Wine Project, uh, which stands for Wine is not an emulator. And the idea was to run Win32 applications on the Linux desktop. So people were building applications for this uh, Windows operating system. I refused, in principle, to run the Windows operating system. So I contributed to this project um, for a while. And uh, this turned out to be, <laughs> a pro I mean, this is a project that is still going on and is what powers a lot of uh, video games now on Steam. But, um, but uh, you know, back in the day, if you're thinking 1992, this is really moving at a very slow pace. So we started considering other alternatives, what other things we could do. But you can see already that like the Uno people, there were some platforms out there that I wanted, and I wanted to get that code running on my favorite platform. Um, then we attempted to, um, to work on an open source version of Java when Java became a big thing. And the challenge that we had with Java was that Java was free to use, but it was not free in the free software definition terms or open source terms. So while some of us really believe in the mission, the problem that, uh, that Java posed for us was that there was not enough people that care about this principle. So I say, what do I care? This thing is, you know, I can download it and it runs. Um, for us in the free software community, that meant that Java was unavailable to us. So we couldn't really bet on Java at the time. Again, remember, this is 1990, at this point it's like 1995. So we tried to build a community around a clone of Java, and there were multiple attempts, multiple false starts, and um, it didn't really pan out the way that we wanted. Um, 
So uh, by 1997, uh, I, there was another one of uh, there was another challenge with free software, and we ended up launching the GNOME Desktop. And I'm not going to go into the whole story, but um, I launched this effort called the GNOME Desktop, and the idea was to create a user interface for Linux desktops, uh, something that would be uh, as pleasant to use as Windows 95 at the time or a Mac. And you can see here uh, the GNOME Desktop in all of its glory. Um, there's a <laughs> There's a couple of things uh, worth pointing out. We were ahead of the game when it came to tiles and, and gradients. Uh, we really use gradients everywhere. Um, this is not the worst screenshot. This is not the worst screenshot. They, it got a lot worse. But I'm trying to reflect 1.0. I'm not trying to reflect some of the advanced uses of this. Uh, some of the interesting things uh, that you might not notice is that I used a technique that was incredibly useful to get uh, artists to work with me. So, uh, there were some people that drew icons in our community, but they would do it on their spare time. And, uh, and they're the ones that build the new GNOME UI. Uh, you know, if you use GNOME today, it's a glorious, beautiful thing. But this is what it started looking like. And I don't know if you can tell, but on the top, there's this, uh, you know, on the file managers, there's a, there's, a, there's a blue square showing the folder. And next to it, there's a piston, uh, which was our default icon for I don't know what this is. And next to it, do you see that thing that says SL? Do you guys see that one? All right, so that stands for symbolic link. Um, so uh, <laughs> I didn't have icons, and I couldn't draw anything. So I, the initial version of all the icons of our file manager were just letters, right? So one of them said slash dev. Another one said exe, right? Um, and this offended the sensibilities of our designers so much and the community that they started creating the, uh, all the artwork that you see today in GNOME. So all the artwork that today you see in GNOME and artwork that today a lot of people use on their websites because it's free, uh, was inspired by this terrible design of mine that I had here. Now there are other, some, uh, there are other really great elements here. Um, you know, we were big in, uh, in uh, pluggable architectures. Now, it's, you know, most of you probably use VS Code today and use um, all these plugins, but I think well, we're ahead of the time. And what you see at the bottom is the panel. What, you know, Windows had the start menu, we had the panel. And each one of those little icons, at least, well, the first one, two, three, four, five icons, those are applets. So they're little programs running, uh, their processes are running and displaying on the screen. Then you have launcher apps and then, you know, some two or three more. Um, applications on the right. Um, it is fascinating because I think that, uh, you know, in the first year, we had a tremendous uh, amount of people contributing very useful things like, uh, you know, CPU monitors, uh, mail notification things. We had 13 clocks, so one clock for every possible um, uh, <laughs> mood <laughs> that you could use. And we had this thing, very popular one, I don't know if you can tell, but there's a little green thing on the bottom and blue, that's a fish. It's called Wanda the Fish. And uh, the only thing that Wanda the Fish did was just swim. Um, so it was a really extensible desktop. It could do anything that uh, you could desire. But we started to run into some problems. This whole desktop was built in C. And very early on, we wanted to support multiple languages. And the reason, um, you know, and the reason uh, had been this talk by this gentleman here, whose name is John Osterhout. And, uh, and he had said, we need to raise the programming level. You cannot keep writing code in C. It's just too painful, too slow, uh, too easy to make mistakes. It's just incredibly painful. Um, so, um, uh, and he had written a language that I, uh, you know, it's not great. It's called TCL, TCL. And um, so we tried a bunch of different things. Because we were a GNU project, we said, let's use Scheme. And oh god, that thing was brutal. It took like 10 seconds to start up. Uh, so, you have to remember the machines in which we build this thing. Uh, you know, this is a good machine at the time. Uh, my com personal computer was a 33 megahertz computer. Uh, four megs was sort of standard, at least in Mexico. Uh, and uh, and I was lucky to be at a research center where they had 32 megabyte workstations uh, running Spark. So uh, so that was a high-end computer. But this is the world that we lived in, right? So scripting languages were really not suitable at this point in time. They were really, really too slow. And we tried Python with Troll Perl, and we had bindings for all those. You can go through the history and look at all these things. And we tried. They were just too slow at the time. We just couldn't keep up with that. Um, then, uh, then I wrote what one of the things I'm most proud of, the numeric spreadsheet, which was designed to compete with Excel. 
It's, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful C code bases out there. Um, not because I wrote it, bec but because I have good taste. And, um, uh, and, uh, and sadly, I have to give up on Gnumeric, and I'll tell you why in a second. But I started a company with my friend, Nat Friedman. Um, he's now uh, the CEO of GitHub. But we started our first company called Zimian. And we focused on Linux on the desktop. So we took GNOME, that ugly thing that you saw, and we launched this thing called the, the Zimian desktop. And it was way better. As you can see, we already started to polish a lot of things. We started to clean things up. Uh, we started to apply a lot of more design. And uh, you know, we launched this company in 1999. And in parallel to building a Linux desktop, we built this uh, clone, right? Where we were all about having free software and have software that run on every platform uh, be available. So we built this clone of Outlook uh, called Zimian Evolution. And again, it was an incredibly painful thing to do. Very, very painful to write, you know, email, calendar, and contacts, uh, you know, connecting to Exchange and all these things in C. And it was starting to get very, very painful. Um, so we came up with an agreement with Sun at that point, where in exchange for, so we said, why don't you open source up an office? And they said, all right, we'll open source up an office on the condition that you kill Gnumeric. I was telling this story last night, and. Um, and we said, all right, well, we'll kill Gnumeric. We'll, we won't develop Gnumeric anymore, but you'll open source our office. And they open sourced our office. It became open office. Now it's called LibreOffice. Um, but what I didn't count on is that while my company, Zimian, and myself uh, committed to not develop Gnumeric anymore, people just took Gnumeric and kept going with it. And, <laughs> and it's being developed to this day, right? And, and in fact, the statistical functions are a lot better than anything out there. But uh, but we were still in a world of pain. All of these things are written in C and C++. So around this time, around 2000, 2001, Microsoft announces .NET, and this is just what the doctor ordered. Why? Because it was a high-level language, but it, had a, uh, but it was designed to be JIT compiled, and it was designed to run very fast. It was a combination of strong types, um, high-level programming, and uh, speed that we desired. So we decided to clone that thing. So Microsoft launched this thing, and I launched a clone of this thing, like everything else I've done so far in my life. So I started to clone the .NET runtime. Then over time, Microsoft took the .NET framework and started to fork in different directions. So they created this thing called the .NET Compact Framework. And then .NET on Linux took off. It was doing wonderfully. It was amazing. Uh, we had seven desktop apps. Um, it was an explosion of desktop apps on Linux. <laughs> you have to remember, the apps at the time were garbage. So these were you know, the best music player, the best launcher, the best uh, photo management, uh, the best indexing software. I mean, we were basking in the glory of managed code until Novell signed a patent license agreement with Microsoft, and it was the end of it. Uh, Mono was seen as a Trojan horse against the open source community, and from 2006 until 2011, they were the most miserable lives of my life uh, when I just got a barrage of attacks on a daily basis. Uh, it was really a disaster. It was miserable years. So anyways, at that point, we started to work with a company called Unity, and they embraced the Mono runtime, not for building applications, but for speeding up games. Um, and also, uh, around 2007, you know, if I'm going to be the bad guy in the open source world, I might as well fully embrace .NET. So uh, Microsoft came up with this thing called Silverlight, which was a Flash competitor and was designed to, to spice up the web at the time. Uh, this is one of the, the apps that they had that, uh, that we really like, called the Silverlight Airlines. And we got this thing, we cloned Silverlight in 21 days, or we cloned enough of Silverlight to run this app in 21 days. Um, so, as you can see, the, the .NET world starts to fork, and uh, what? And I also cloned Silverlight uh, with this thing called Moonlight. Um, and then a couple of years go by, and Unity and uh, Apple launches this iPhone thing in 2008, and Unity comes to us and says, hey, you know, we bet the whole company on this .NET thing, but we're stuck. This thing does not do JIT compilation. What are we going to do? So we built a static compiler for them, right? Um, and we helped Unity put Mono on the iPhone. And, and it was incredible, because Unity was a company uh, made up at the time, I think, of five people. Um, and when we went to the Game Developer Conference, they had a booth the size of this thing, right, this square right here. Um, and within a year, they grew from these uh, five or six people, or 
four, pe four to six people, to about 75 people, and they run one of the largest booths at GDC, at the Game Developer Conference. So it was a smash success, right? Uh, the iPhone was the future, everybody was building apps, and they were just selling this product like hot pancakes. So we figured, huh, this iPhone has something. Um, so we decided to build our own product, right? So Unity was real, they really had their graphics engine, and they used Mono as a scripting language for your game. Uh, but we said, why don't we do the same thing that we did on the Linux desktop? Let's bring the .NET runtime and add APIs for the platform. So we launched our own product at Novell, it's called Monotouch, and I couldn't find the logo, um, the original logo that I really liked. Um, but uh, but we launched it, and it was very, very successful. I'm not going to get into the, uh, into the details of what happened next, but um, you can see that the .NET world is starting to get a little bit more complicated. You got .NET, and at the same time, Microsoft is entering the, the mobile race, and they don't release one version, but like 10 different versions. I can't even remember what they are. Um, but the key one was Windows 8. So we got Windows 8, you got Silverlight, you got the desktop mono, you got mono mobile, you got Unity. Um, in 2011, we launched our company called Xamarin. So we took that IP that had been developed at Novell, we licensed it, and we built a company fully dedicated to bringing .NET to mobile devices. So this is roughly what the world looked like at this point, and then Microsoft open source .NET Core. Um, and .NET Core, like every, you know, like a good tradition in the .NET world, had a different API. Everybody had different needs. So this is what the ecosystem looks like at this point. Um, and there had been some um, courageous attempts at solving this problem. How can we share code when, when nobody agrees on what the APIs should be? And, uh, you know, it was painful, lots of learned lessons, but eventually the folks at Microsoft, and I'm thinking about Microsoft as an external entity because I was outside at the time, uh, came up with this thing called the .NET standard. So we said, we'll agree on a set of APIs that work everywhere, and we worked together to make sure that this worked. So it was an effort between the Mono folks, the Unity folks, and ourselves to make sure that this worked. Um, then the other thing that started to happen is that we started to take some .NET Core code, and uh, .NET started to take some Mono code. So there started to be some cross-pollination of the code bases. Um, and, um, and that was very interesting and great. Um, and we started to advance a lot of the capabilities that were available in a cross-platform way. .NET Standard 1 had been a tiny subset, but at least it worked everywhere. And we kept adding 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? So, um, but eventually we had enough of a big uh, set of new APIs that we launched the .NET Standard 2.0. And it was a joint effort across all the three major vendors that supported, uh, that supported um, .NET. Now, uh, it is time for us to launch uh, .NET Core 3.0. Uh, .NET Core 3.0 is on preview, has been for the best part of the summer, and, uh, and this is really uh, roughly where the APIs are today. We got a Win10 API, we got a .NET API that you know, we're, we're now gonna keep uh, sort of uh, stable and frozen in time because changing that .NET is very, very difficult uh, without breaking people. And the same thing is happening with Mono, so that you see that the errors sort of stop there. And the essentially, the modern versions of .NET are those four things that you see there. And, uh, you know, it's about to launch any minute now. Uh, hopefully, we'll be next week at the .NET conference. Um, but we started to think about what will the future be for us, because right now we have, you know, we have these four separate set of APIs, these uh, separate code bases. So earlier this year, we announced uh, .NET 5. And essentially, we're converging everything into .NET 5. And there's an, there's an error missing there, but we'll get to that if we have time. Um, so we're all going to standardize into a single .NET 5, but we're going to make this .NET 5 work for all of us. So what is it that we're doing here? Um, so we're doing two things. The first one is um, we're going to solve the easy problem first, which is right now we have many different implementations of the same set of class libraries. So we're coalescing into a single implementation called CoreFX. Now, CoreFX has been tuned for high performance, has been tuned for high throughput, has been tuned for the server market, and to some extent now to, uh, to support WinForms and WPF. Um, so what we're going to be working for the next year, right? So just so you know, .NET is now on a yearly cadence, so we're going to do every year, we're going to do one version of .NET. And that means that sometimes we might not do as much as we want, so we rather cut features 
then delay the release, right? So, so this is why it's not as comprehensive as it could be. So what we're doing for .NET 5 is we're going to share all the class libraries. We're going to make the class libraries be mobile friendly. And what does that mean? Well, sometimes it means having lighter implementations of certain things. Sometimes it means using system services instead of .NET services, for example, for string collation, for localization, for all these things. Um, uh, you know, culture tables, uh, sp domain specific tables, calendar tables. Um, in other cases, it means uh, making the code, uh, right now the code is super coupled, right? And one of the things that we did with the mobile port is that we made it so that there were a couple of points, right, that linked the pieces of code together. And these few points could be broken by a linker. So a linker could reason about your application, and if it detects that you don't really need this capability, it can break that link. Right, so these implicit things um, could be broken up. So there's a lot of work into introducing these weak points that can be broken up by a linker. And lastly, we need to integrate all the work that we did for Android, for iOS, and WebAssembly into CoreFX. Now, the um, the one thing, uh, one of the side effects of this is that today we're going to have two VMs. We're going to have the Core CLR VM. Right, this is what you use today with .NET Core. Um, and we're going to have the mono VM. Both of them are going to be part of .NET 5. Um, and you'll get to choose one or the other. And there's a lot of variables there, so you can, in how you choose those two. And, and, you know, we'll get more into that in the future. But essentially, you would pick the core VM typically for server workloads or desktop workloads that require a higher performance just in time engine. Um, they support clear compilation, so they can do a quick JIT and then a more optimized JIT. It has a, what I like to call the Mayoni GC, uh, <laughs> which is .NET's uh, fabulous and fantastic, scalable, multiprocessor, uh, slow pulse time, background uh, garbage collector uh, that ships is .NET. And all these capabilities come at a price in size, right? So these are fantastic capabilities, but you probably don't need that in a, in a mobile device with one CPU or even six CPUs uh, with limited RAM. And it's also designed for high scalability. So what that means is that uh, if you so throw 32 CPUs at this thing, you know, it will basically scale almost linearly to how many CPUs you throw at the problem. So there's little locking and contention internally. The Mono VM, on the other hand, it's a very light VM. It's tiny, tiny VM. Um, and they're really, this VM can use multiple different code generation engines, right? So one is the original mono uh, code generation engine that we've used for many, many years. Uh, it's very, very fast at jitting, and it ger generates terrible code. Right? So it's like, we jit quick, but it's not very good. Right? It's like, uh, you know, you can either have cheap, or what's the other one? Cheap, good, and one of those. I can't remember. Um, so, uh, or... You can say, hey, I don't care about the startup time. Just give me the best code you can. And at this point, we throw everything to this, uh, this thing called the LLVM, the low-level virtual machine code generator. This is the thing that powers almost any modern uh, new compiler, C and C++ compilers nowadays. Uh, is what powers Rust, what powers Julia, what powers, uh, you know, everything out there is powered by this thing. It's a, it's a state-of-the-art compiler, super extensible, a pleasure to work with. And uh, the problem is it's very slow, very, very slow, like 40 times slower than Mono. But the code that it generates, is, um, it's undistinguishable from magic. You cannot even figure out how is this possible. This makes no sense. Uh, if you read the code, it's like, oh, this is you know, obfuscated code. But no, it's, uh, it's incredible. And uh, you can tier the compilation between those two. So I'll talk about that more in a second. Also, it has a much lighter GC. Uh, it doesn't have the traditional .NET Gen 0, Gen 1, Gen 2. Uh, SGN GC is a much simpler GC. It's still precise. It's still generational. But it can have multiple Gen zeros. We call those nurseries. So it can have multiple nurseries. And also, it doesn't have a fixed heap. It can have multiple heaps. And the reason is that in some of these mobile devices, you can't really allocate big blocks of memory. You cannot expect uh, contiguous blocks of memory. So we have to deal with the fact that these operating systems were guests in an operating system that might be doing things uh, that we don't expect them to. So 
When it comes to the mono execution engines, and from here on, I'm going to focus a lot into the mono VM because that's the project that I've been working on the most. Uh, but you know, there's there's a lot of great stuff happening in CoreCLR, but today I'm going to focus mostly on mono VM. So um, the mono VM actually has a number of execution modes. One of them is the interpreter, and this allows you to run CIL code, right, .NET code, with an interpreter, right. Uh, the nice thing about this is that it's it's, uh, it's very easy to port, so you can put it on any platform in a couple of days, right? It's, it's a matter of really building mono and, and getting it running. So um, and there's a little bit of gluing P involved, but uh, it's very easy to get it ported. Uh, we've been working uh, a lot in getting the performance to the right point. Right now, it's about 7.5 times slower than the, than the chip JIT. So not bad. Um, so about 10 times lower, uh, roughly. The nice thing is that it, it, it has no additional footprint, right? It's super cheap. Uh, if you have an assembly and you have your runtime, your take a megabyte runtime, you're off to the races. Um, then we have a just-in-time compiler, and this just-in-time compiler can either generate code with the, you know, with the chip jet, or it can generate code with LVM. So you get to choose w one of those two. Um, and again, it doesn't take any uh, any space on uh, on disk, but you do pay you know startup cost. Then you can choose to use ahead of time compilation. And we actually here we have two separate set of ahead of time compilation. We have a, uh, kind of a good balance ahead of time compilation, which is we'll compile almost everything, but the tricky pieces we're going to JIT compile because at runtime we can generate better code than if we decide to generate the code statically. Uh, and the Q&A, we can go over the specifics, but it's basically the best possible blend of all worlds. This is really what you want to do. Uh, now, the only problem is that it increases the footprint of your executable, because you now you have your IL, and then you bloat it with native code that you have to ship on disk. And it's about 2x the original size of the IL, roughly. And full AOT is something that you need to use on things like iOS, WinRT, Xbox, PlayStation, and things like that, where there's no excuses. You cannot ever generate JIT coded in any scenario. Um, the beautiful thing about this thing is no startup cost, but there's a couple of pieces of code that, um, in particular, they're called virtual generic methods that are very difficult to optimize, and we generate not great code. So uh, just avoid virtual generic methods. So um, the problem with full static compilation, not only this thing that I just mentioned, but uh, there were capabilities that didn't work, like the C-sharp dynamic keyword, which is used by Entity Framework. <laughs> so, and people use that. Um, system reflection emit and assembly.load, right? So you couldn't really load plugins dynamically. You couldn't generate code dynamically if you wanted to. So uh, not the end of the world, but you know, some of you, uh, some of our customers started to complain loudly that, hey, this is not real .NET, it doesn't have everything. So we started to look into, into solving that problem. Now, before I move on from this, um, one thing that you can do once you have all this execution mode is that you can mix these modes of execution. And we've been using this in pointed scenarios as defaults. You can do it on your own if you want. You can control it. But dif di we, what we do is we give you good defaults now. So you can make static compilation with some interpretation. You can, you can mix the interpreter with the JIT and the IoT compiler, and so on. You can, you ha can have a blend of these things. In particular, we just released this thing for Android. Uh, because on Android, we tend to do everything was JITed. And you pay a really high cost on startup. So we were paying about 1.5 seconds of JIT time uh, and uh, you know, an app that you know you launch would take three seconds, and you would go insane over those three seconds. And the reality is that 1.5 seconds of that was just JIT time. Um, and if you turned on AOT, well, now you eliminate the 1.5 seconds, but but now you have this monster of an app that you distribute to your users. Um, so here are some stats of of the defaults that you can expect with this thing. So what is really nice is that we said, what if we just AOT everything? <laughs> up to the point of launching your Android app, right? So everything you need to initialize forms or anything you initialize uh, the, the basic Android runtime, and we we'll just AOT that piece, and we'll ship that piece. And we'll optimize a few other things, like uh, you know, string is useful to optimize, and a bunch of other things. So we chose a couple of things to pre-compile, and everything else is JIT compiled. So this is, uh, this is one of the default modes that we're giving you. Now, 
Tier compilation exists in Core CLR, and we're bringing it to Mono as well. And it is the following. Imagine that you have this program that, you know, a main program that calls write line. Write line on its own calls, you know, get the character for each one of these, and then calls individual write method, and then, you know, you might do a read line. And, um, and the idea is the following. The idea is that instead of generating the plain code like this, what you do is you generate instrumented code. And what the instrumented code does is that it, it keeps a counter on how much you use this method. So uh, the more that a method is used, the hotter the, meta, the method is considered. So for example, in this scenario, the main method is called once, the right line method is called once, get chart is called 120 times, write 120 times, write, and read line once. So what happens is that the instrumented code at some point uh, decides, you know what, um, you know what, let's start with zeros, and uh, and as you start to to hit your marks, eventually when you hit this number a hundred times, uh, what happens is that what happens is that this code that was quickly generated very quickly, we now call LVM, you know, the heavy duty slow compiler, and uh, and we generate optimized versions of that code. Right, we generate the optimized version of that code. And then we make the original methods call the other ones, and we patch the original call sites when possible to call the new methods. So the idea is that methods that are being used a lot, we essentially recompile them with a much, uh, uh, with a much better optimizing engine. And that strikes a balance between, uh, uh, between fast startup and getting the, 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 the best performance you can get. Now, Back to the interpreter. Uh, the interpreter that we're using today was uh, a resurrection of the interpreter that we originally built for Mono in 2001. So about a year and a half ago, we decided to, to bring that code back from the dead. Uh, we had to do some spelunking to get it back, but, uh, but we got it. And initially, it was all about fixing c -sharp dynamic and assembly.load. Um, but uh, you know, the nice thing about the interpreter is that these are these features that compound very nicely. So once you enable this thing, a whole world of possibilities for all these platforms uh, is enabled. So for example, the first one is, you know, most, <laughs> you know, every static constructor by definition will run once, right? So, and very few of them do heavy work, right? So what you can do is you can basically say, hey, all the static constructors is running with the interpreter. There's no point. In, in, in JIT compiling, wasting memory, or anything like that. Um, and the ones that, n that do hot code, like initializing thousands of tables, you can annotate and say, hey, JIT compile this one, right? Um, then it also enabled .NET on WebAssembly to be a pleasant experience. So the first version that we did of .NET for WebAssembly took IL code, compiled it all the way down to WebAssembly, and this beast took about I, I mean, the first time was like half an hour, right? It's like, oh, this is not good, <laughs> right? Um, the tooling was very, very primitive when we first did it. And, uh, you know, we, we kept improving and I kept getting better, but it was annoying, right? You were compiling for the web, it was taking a long time, and, um, and that wasn't suitable. So then we tried the interpreter, and the interpreter was magical because you compile the runtime once, you just upload your DLLs, and you reload them. Right, so you don't need to reload the whole VM every time, and you can keep the cache version in there. So um, the only downside is that you know uh, when you compare .NET running on the interpreter versus JavaScript, <laughs> it doesn't look good, right, performance-wise. Um, and it's also the foundation for all the new hot reload uh, work that we're doing at Microsoft. We're doing so we're bringing hot reload to all Xamarin apps, and you know we'll talk about uh, some of that in a minute, but. Uh, uh, but it, it powers all of that, right? So we're actually doing it in two stages. Uh, the first stage is we want, just wanted to get XAML hot reloading. That is the easy piece. So you modify your XAML, and it will reload dynamically in your simulator or your environment. That is the first piece. The second one that is the exciting one to me, the most exciting one, is we will do c -sharp hot reloading. So as you're changing your code, if your code doesn't fundamentally change the structure of your app, we'll reload your code live and rerun your code live. Um, so this is coming later this year. And we're also using to experiment with new programming models. Some of you might have seen a thing called Fabulous, uh, which is a prototype of a new way of building UI applications. It's built on F-sharp, and it uses a different pattern than, than what XAML does, which is what you want to use this. Uh, it's a pattern called Model View Update, very similar to React, very similar to Flutter, uh, very similar to Swift UI. 
So we have now a prototype in F-sharp with Fabulous, and we're experimenting with things in C-sharp and you know, trying to understand whether people will like this or not. Now, I want to close my, uh, my presentation with a little bit about what we're doing with WebAssembly and .NET, uh, which to me is uh, very exciting. It's the wild west of, of runtimes. And uh, this is a chart that I took from the Mozilla website where they introduced WebAssembly. And, and, they, and their pitch is very interesting, right? We'll take any programming language, we'll generate this intermediate representation, right? This, this, uh, and we'll pack it in a WebAssembly thing, and then you can run it on any platforms that support WebAssembly. Now, um, this is our graph. I was trying to find my version of this thing from 2001, 2002, 2003, because I had the identical thing for .NET, right? Um, Dot .NET was a little bit more ambitious because it made a promise that C Sharp would work with BASIC, with Python, with Perl, with any other language. This vision, sadly, did not quite get realized. And, and it seems like the WebAssembly vision will get realized. Um, the interrupt between these things, it's still not great. But at least you can run all of these things together. Um, and you know, in this example, they're showing x86 on ARM, but right now it runs on almost anything. So I am very excited about WebAssembly. It's probably one of the most exciting things happening right now. And like I said, it's the Wild West. It's, uh, there's a lot of new ground. There's a lot of new things. Um, unlike the previous part of my career where I was very happy making open source versions of existing tech, uh, this is a space where there's, it's a worldwide collaboration of uh, companies, individuals just trying to, uh, to make this vision happen. And it is very exciting for many ways. The first one is, WebAssembly is probably, <laughs> you know, it runs on every modern web browser. So every web browser that you can run on, on PCs, on, uh, uh, you know, on Linux, on Windows, on Mac, on Android, on iOS, on Tizen devices, it runs everywhere. Um, the second piece is it, it has all the benefits of the web deployment model, right? But it also has all the speed of native code. So you're not limited by the JavaScript performance. You're not limited by you know, the JIT figuring out what you're trying to do. Um, you get all those benefits. And uh, it, comes, you know, it comes with an, a, a, a POSIX library. Now, if you're Windows people, you don't really appreciate what this means. But, uh, but all of Linux is built just on this tiny foundation, the POSIX library. Um, and uh, you know, uh, the only downside today is that WebAssembly has one presentation mode, which is the HTML and the DOM. It works for many uses. It's not great for other uses, right? So you know, there's there's some pros and cons there. Um, but like I said, the key here really is that this tiny POSIX-like library. It's essentially a whole OS, right? This is all you need. You can treat this thing as running your application in 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 a containerized way. Um, so you can essentially run any Unix libraries. You can run any Unix uh, uh, commands here, modulo, if you figure out how to uh, get things into the screen. But, um, but it, you basically can embed any Unix command inside a web page, right? And any Unix library. And this is a vast, you know, uh, a vast set of things, right? I mean, Chromebooks have shown that you can now have a full operating system, which is delightful, entirely built of open source software. So you essentially can put any of those things in a web page, right? So with all, all this excitement in mind, right? So we put .NET on WebAssembly. Uh, today, there's a few challenges, uh, you know, and, uh, and our intent is to fix um, almost all of those, right? And, uh, and I'm not going to go through those, but what I can tell you is that uh, today, we're struggling between these two worlds, right? On the one hand, we can do fast development, right? With the interpreter, we can develop very quickly, but it doesn't run very fast. Or we can compile and do AUT compilation, and then you know it takes a long time, but it's going to run really fast. So we're trying to get these two worlds closer together. And it's not just work that we're doing. It's work that the WebAssembly community is doing, the tooling community is doing. We used to use all this set of uh, hacked up things that were needed for WebAssembly. Now all of this is part of LVM. So the LVM optimizing compiler now does this. Um, like I said, LVM is not the fastest compiler, but you know it's all now integrated. Um, 
it has, uh, you know, there's you know, a lot of people prototyping things with WebAssembly. Um, two of the most exciting ones are the Uno platform. That's what we're here for, and you'll hear more about this today, I imagine. Um, and also Blazor, which is uh, it's a, it's a new programming model for, for web pages, uh, where you essentially bring ASP.NET and you run it all on the client side. Um, and there's a lot of people for this uh, style of development, and um, I am actually very excited about this thing. It's, uh, it's taken off like fire. Um, uh, so, you know, we are supporting the Blazor folks, and the Blazor folks are giving us a <laughs> list of bugs to fix and things to improve the experience. But to me, what makes WebAssembly so exciting is really that um, that is now available outside the browser, right? So it's not just the browser technology. Um, you can run it on a console app. And here I have listed three virtual machines that will run your WebAssembly code on the console, uh, but they're not the only ones, right? The most popular one, of course, is Node, right? So if you're running Node applications on the server, you can also now embed the code in any of these languages inside your Node app. Uh, Wasmer is, uh, is takes this jitted approach of running WASM code, but uh, runs it through the LLVM compilation engine or crane lift, which is the engine built by the Firefox people. So you can use either one of those code generation engines. As you can imagine, LLVM is <laughs> you know, as, clo as, as close as you're going to get to God, right? Um, and then there's this other one that is very, very interesting called Lucet. And it, is, uh, it was built by a company called Fastly. And what they do is they do isolation, right? So they run the statically compiled uh, 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 Wasmer instances, and they're isolated from each other. That's one of the other things that is great about WebAssembly is it has a beautiful isolation model and reuse model uh, for the code. You essentially load code, and you can give it multiple uh, address spaces, right? So the code is immutable, and the address space is there, and you can create multiple instances of this. So the same app can run with multiple personalities at once. Uh, think of it as uh, .NET app domains done right, right? So app domains sadly didn't really uh, fulfill their vision, and you know these days people frown upon them. This is the right way of doing application domains, right? Um, but it, it does get uh, even better, right? So not only you can run these web, WebAssembly applications uh, uh, in a standalone mode, but uh, for the .NET people, there's these really two exciting ways of running uh, uh, WebAssembly with .NET, right? The first one is you can take any WebAssembly code, right, written in any language, and you can run it through um, you can run it through the, uh, uh, these two tools. One is the Wasmer Sharp engine. Right, so you can, if you're a desktop app or a server app, you can just embed with Wasmer Sharp, uh, and that will get it running for you. Or the other thing is you can use uh, Eric Sync, which is a community member uh, uh, tool, who wrote a tool called Wasm to CIL. So what he does is he takes your Wasm code and generates .NET code and generates a nice, nice DLL, and you just reference this assembly like if it was. Um, you know, any other .NET library, but it might be written in Rust, might be written in, in C++, might be written in C Sharp. And the reason why he built it is because if you have done mobile apps that require native code, you've probably faced this problem. Let's say you need to ship a native library, and I think Jerome is in the audience here, I was just talking about this last night, um, but when he put the Uno calculator, there's this tiny, beautiful, math library, hyper rational library, very, very nice library for, for calculation written in C or C++, I can't remember. Um, and, uh, and the problem is he ported the whole thing to you know, the, this uh, calculator from C++ to C Sharp and made it use Uno, but he still needs this nasty, <laughs> right, this nasty uh, C or C++ code base. And if you want to make this available across the board, you gotta you, you gotta build it for every ABI. You gotta build it for every Android ABI, every Android platform, every Apple operating system, right? You know you don't have to, but if you want to have full reach, this is what you would do. And you know for some applications like the Uno calculator, you might say, hey, listen, I'll support the iPad and the iPhone. I don't care about the Mac. I don't care about TV. Uh, you know, I don't really care about you know half the form factors of Android, so maybe you're done. But if you're writing a NuGet, a NuGet, that you would like everybody <laughs> in the world to use, um, if you want to build a NuGet that is universally useful, you really want to build 
the Android, the Apple, the Linux, the, well, the, the 10 different Linuxes, Linux I, um, the, you know, the BSD, the Windows, the Mac, right? Uh, the 32, the 64 versions, right? So you have this explosion of these things. And some of us do better than others. I guess I'm in the latter part. Um, some people do better than me. And um, so when I build my library, I target like three or four platforms. But other people that are very, uh, very good at this, like the Skia, uh, Skia Sharp from Matthew. So what is very nice about what Eric Singh did is like he said, hey, listen, I need SQLite on all the platforms, and I'm tired of dealing with this thing. Let me just compile everything, everything at once to CIL. And uh, so he used the WASM tooling that converted to .NET, and now he doesn't have to deal with this. You have a binary across all platforms. It's magical. Now, to add these capabilities, they introduced a thing called the uh, WebAssembly, was the sandbox thing. So they introduced this new thing called the WebAssembly system interface, WASI. This is by no means done. This is really, this is not even the Wild West. There's nothing, there's not even water here. Uh, people are building this as they go, and it's changing very, very rapidly. So, you know, by the time this talk is over, it's probably already changed from what it was last night. Um, but this is the future. I am convinced that this is the future for, uh, for, for uh, deploying code. So as for what it is in our agenda right now. So we want to polish what we have in .NET for WebAssembly. And, uh, and uh, you know, all the gaps that I listed I didn't go into, we're going to work on those things. That is my immediate need. Uh, we also want to improve the development integration. So we're going to use one of these mix modes to do a little bit of AOT, enough to get you your startup in place, right? To shorten the startup time, but not enough that it bloats your application. Um, and the next thing that we want to do is we want to reduce the executable sizes. So a lot of the work that goes into trimming and making these things break up. Now, this is what we're planning on doing from here to November. Now, on the longer term, so this is what you can expect towards .NET 3, is we're going to put a lot of work into optimizing the size for WebAssembly. Um, and, uh, and the other piece that we're going to be working on is on improving the build times. And lastly, and this is kind of the stretch goal, is can we JIT compile on WebAssembly? Now, it is possible, but inefficient today. So we're trying to work with the committees to make sure that the capabilities that .NET would need to effectively JIT code in this world are there. And if not, we'll fall back to something that is you know, far from ideal, but would still work for those of you that need it, that need to balance uh, startup and getting uh, good performance. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much, folks. And, uh, and, and I'll see you around in the conference.